Welcome to Walnut Creek CERT's presentation of CERT Unit 8, Terrorism and CERT. This recording was made on March 14th, 2023. The presenter is Don Prosnitz, a longtime Walnut Creek CERT, as well as Lieutenant Bruce Jower of the Walnut Creek Police Department. Let's join this presentation now. Okay, all right, so thank you uh, uh, briefly. So uh, I am a longtime member of CERT. It seems like a, a, well over a decade. Uh, by training, I'm an experimental physicist. Um, I ran, uh, my experience relevant for this is I ran all the Homeland Security programs at Livermore. And I was uh, chief science and technology advisor for the uh, US Department of Justice during the World Trade Center and the Amerithrax uh, attacks. So uh, I have no hands on in the field dealing with it, but I've dealt with a lot, uh, both academically and sort of from a management level at senior levels in, in the government. As always, we start with personal safety as the number one priority. So uh, you've seen these slides before, oh, yeah. you, always, you always show up prepared. Uh, we work as a team. It's critical you size up where you are. And of course, the goal is always the greatest good for the greatest number. All right, so this is what we're gonna do as we go through the unit. We're gonna talk about what is terrorism, get into targets, tactics, and weapons, uh, what to do if you're involved in a terrorist attack, how to counter terrorism, and of course, how to prepare for it. <clears throat> so what is terrorism? Uh, the Department of Justice defines it as the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government. <clears throat> So my typical definition is a little bit, I'll show you another one, but mine is very simple. It's something I would do to Margaret because I want to influence what Judy does. So I, I take care, I, I do something to somebody who's innocent because I want somebody else to change what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> sort of a more thorough definition of, of terrorism is the one that is used principally by academics as they study terrorism. And it's a threatened or actual use of illegal force and violence by a non-state actor, not a government, to attain a political, economic, or religious, or social goal through fear, coercion, or intimidation. And it does recognize psychological impact. It has to be intended to coerce somebody, and it has to convey a message to a larger audience. As I said, I do something to one person to influence the other, and it's illegal. Now, you might say, <clears throat> why do I even care about the definition of terrorism? If I'm in the middle of an incident, I don't care what their goal is. I would need to stay safe and keep everybody around me safe. And of course, that's true. And uh, we, uh, uh, Bruce will talk a little bit about what, ha what, how to handle if you're in the middle of an incident. But understanding what terrorism is helps us prepare for it and deal with it after the fact. If we understand the definition, it sort of helps us a little bit with dealing with the implications before and after. Uh, there's a long history of terrorism in the United States. We, I know we all think about what's happened recently, but it's been going on for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the early part of the past century, there were explosions in San Francisco that had to do with whether the US was gonna enter World War I or not. There was uh, bombings on Wall Street from the anarchists. Uh, <clears throat> there's a bomb at LaGuardia Airport in New York. Uh, that uh, injured a whole lot of people. So these are all a long time ago. Uh, of course, the Unabomber, I don't know if you remember that, he sent bombs to a whole bunch of people. He was an, uh, an anti-technologist. <clears throat> of course, the World Trade Towers, and then more recently um, in San Bernardino, I think this is San Bernardino. What's important to realize is as awful as these things are, the actual uh, statistics show that the fatalities are not that great. So it's 280 over, over five years. They, oh, in recent history, they tend to average about 30 or so fatalities a year. So I'm saying this in a very cold fashion. It's obviously not if you're in an incident or if you die, but it helps you understand uh, the impact that's outside, that's, that's above and beyond the actual physical impact of the incident, which is of course what they're after. <clears throat> so some of their goals are tactical, mass casualties, loss of critical resources, disruption of vital services, uh, uh, recruiting and fundraising. I mean, sometimes they do it and they try and, and use it and then advertise, look how good we are. We want to do, do all, all these other things. 
Uh, <clears throat> and uh, how do we deal with that? Well, the key thing is to pay attention to what's going on around you. So if you pay it, if you see uh, uh, an unintended, you've heard this many times, if you see an unintended backpack or something, say something about it. If you see something, say something is, is, the, is the phrase. And attention to surroundings can defeat terrorist goals. Uh, how many of you ever done that? Have you ever seen something and then, and then reported it? I can't see the hands, but I know I have done that. And, and it's a hard thing to do because you think, well, I'm just being paranoid about it and I'm gonna get somebody else in trouble. That's not your problem. The problem is, is whoever you report it to and it's up to them to figure out what to do with, what to do about it. So don't worry about it if that happens and you'll regret it, of course, if you don't do it. Now we talked about tactical goals, but the real goal is, the real goals are, are strategic. They wanna undermine confidence in the government. They wanna disrupt the economy if they can. They want geopolitical change. Uh, <clears throat> or they wanna heighten the fear and spread information. Now, the key goal of the, of the terrorists is when they do something like this, they're not hurting that many people, but they want what's called social amplification. They want us to make it worse than the actual event is. We do that through social, it can be done through social media, the newspapers blow things up. And it's important as if, if that we stay calm, if we know what's going on, we don't blow what's happening up out of all proportion. Um, uh, Margaret says I shouldn't tell old stories, but I don't know if, how many of you remember the Washington sniper or snipers. Many, many years ago, there were two folks running around in a white van and shooting people. It was awful. They killed, uh, I see somebody waving their hand, Dave. Uh, I think, I don't know, remember the numbers, Dave. It was what, 15 people or 12 people, at, but it shut down the whole city for a very, very long time. It shut down schools, it did all sorts of things well beyond the impact of what was going on. So that's the kind of thing. We actually lived through it. Yeah, I was there at the same time. And, and so you remember it, and I don't know, and, and certainly panic gripped the city, they shut down schools, they did all sorts of things, uh, as opposed, I'm not saying that shouldn't have been done, but it certainly was way out of proportion to the actual, what was actually happening at the time. They had roadblocks up, it was, it was an amazing reaction, and that happens all the time. So it's important that we assert and we talk to our neighbors. We don't say, we don't minimize what's going on, but we do try and keep people calm. And then the terrorists don't win. They don't get what they're trying to do. So they don't achieve their strategic goals if we do not overreact. Now I'm talking about terrorism. <clears throat> uh, that's, I'm distinguishing that from criminal events. Right. So the, so when I said there, you know, 30 people a year, that that doesn't talk. I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, we're not talking at the moment about um, about a disgruntled employee who shoots other people. And Bruce will talk about how to hand again. If you're in the middle of the event, you don't really care. But when I talk about the statistics, I'm certainly not talking about those kinds of events. And, and certainly the Washington snipers were were not, as I recall, not wouldn't be classified terrorists. That was just that was that was sort of a a criminal kind of event. All right, so let's talk about the hazards in Contra Costa, uh, which we normally prepare for in just the course of our events. We worry about fires, we worry about floods, earthquakes, these are natural events. We worry, actually we don't, but, we, but there's a possibility of tsunamis up in the bay. We worry about diseases, uh, certainly extreme weather lately. Uh, technological uh, hazardous, there's hazardous material spills, planes coming down. That happened some time ago in Sun Valley Mall. I, I think a, a plane came down. Trains derailing, we saw that recently. Refineries and pipeline accidents. These are all sorts of things that, that can happen naturally and search could be called out to deal with. And we've talked about these things in the past. Now let's talk about terrorism and the things we worry about. They could start a fire, they could blow up a levee biological attacks, they could attack public buildings, large uh, uh, hazardous materials, they could blow up tanker trucks, many, many of the same things. So by preparing for the natural hazards, we're also preparing for what could happen in, in terrorist events. <clears throat> so of all these kinds of things, wh which ones do you think uh, lately are the ones we have to worry about the most? 
or, or uh, uh, where, what are the trends in this country? Are they uh, worrying about uh, blowing up tanker trucks uh, or refineries, potentially cyber attacks? Fires, floods, and disease. So it could be that. It could be fires, floods, and disease. I guess that was my cohort. And sounded like, I don't know who that was. It turns out in this country, at least, of the events that have happened over the last couple of years, the vast majority of them lately have been at demonstrations, pub, large public gatherings. Those seem to be the targets. It's about uh, something like 50% in, in the last couple of years have happened at those kinds of events. So that's where you need to keep, sort of keep, your, eyes, keep your eyes open. Um, I wanted to read you something if I can find my notes on it. So I recently, um, I recently came, last week I was in Israel. And I don't know if any of you are tracking what's going on in Israel uh, and the West Bank, but <clears throat> there's been a, a, a whole series of disruptions and, quite, and terrorism events perpetrated by both sides. Now, when I travel, I get uh, the companies I work for give me a security alert and they tell me daily what's going on, which is a good thing because it tells you where, what to avoid. So if you're traveling and the, you're in a country where something like this has happened, pay attention to the news so you know where to stay away from. And one of the things they told us, uh, they said, uh, when waiting at a roadside, stand away from the curb. Simple things you can do if you're worried about demonstrations and vehicles and those kinds of things. So these are the ways that you can protect yourself and your family if you think you're in an area where something could happen. Uh, if you want to take part in a demonstration, be careful. And if you don't, it's probably best to just stay away from that because they are, they are targets these days. Okay, I think Judy, I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I think you're up. Yes. Uh, let's see, desktop two. Let's try this one. All right. I need to stop sharing, I think. Oh, I think I just stopped sharing for you. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Uh, did we go through this one, Don? No, nope. you're up. Okay, thank you. Terrorist tactics and weapons. So what, what happens when, uh, ter when a person wants to be a terrorist? Um, they make bombs, they make explosive devices. I, this is uh, one thing that's been in the movies a lot when you see a bottle that has uh, a little Use, you know, a piece of something coming out of the top and they, they light it up and throw it at something and guess what, boom. Uh, firearms vary in the news these days. Vehicles, people, you know, running into each other, running into buildings. Uh, chemical, uh, the train is an issue on that, but it's not so much a terrorist uh, attack. Um, but there can be terrorist attacks of that kind. Biological, radiological, nuclear, we're less likely to see those in this area. Cyber, we may see that in our, in our area. Cyber includes uh, the scams that you see in your, in your email all the time. Uh, let me see. Get back to... So how do you recognize terrorism? Uh, there's eight signs of terrorism. Uh, one is surveillance. One thing is you see people watching or recording or monitoring different activities of a place, somebody that doesn't necessarily belong there, uh, they're, but they're keeping an eye and keeping a re record of what's going on, who's coming, who's going at what times. Elicitation means information is gathered that is specific to the intended target. If somebody's targeting a person, they're going to be studying that person. And this may be gathered by mail, phone, in person, anything you can get. Uh, and elicitation is, uh, is also some of the spam that we get, which is they're trying to get your information from you. Uh, tests of security is local security measures, tests and analyzed. Um, measuring reaction times, you know, if somebody walks through a, into a building that has one of those uh, police, um, uh, uh, the, the guard uh, alarm systems, then, you know, how long does it take before anybody notices? Uh, funding. They're raising, transferring, spending money, which may include selling drugs or stolen merchandise, human trafficking, funneling money through businesses or charities. They're basically trying to get funding for the purpose that they're, um, that they're focused on. Acquiring supplies, uh, gathering weapons, gathering transportation, communications, uh, you know, whatever they need to accomplish their goals. Uh, impersonation or suspicious people 
Um, that's people who do, who do not belong where they are. People impersonating roles, uh, wearing costumes or access to information, people don't fit in. Uh, these are things you want to, uh, you know, as Don mentioned, you see something, say something. You don't know uh, if the person legitimately belongs there. So say something to someone and, uh, and then stand down, stand out of the way. Rehearsals and dry runs. We see this when groups or individuals map out routes, determine traffic flow and timing, and look to see when they can be the most disruptive. And they may also operate test runs before the actual attack. This happens when you have group, um, group uh, demonstrations that you may see people coordinating the demonstrations for the maximum impact during rush hour or something like that. And then deployment, this is the eighth, eighth sign of, of uh, terrorism. Deployment is the final and most urgent phase when terrorists are deploying assets and getting into position. And when you know something bad is about to happen. Uh, so potential indicators, look for unusual and suspicious behavior, something that's out of the ordinary, events or items that are out of the ordinary, um, unattended bags. If you see an unattended bags at the airport, they always say, if you see something that you know nobody's standing next to, say something about that. But it also happens in other public places. If you see you know bags, boxes, packages that are leaking, anything like that. Uh, people that are not dressed for the situation, um, people taking pictures of security arrangements. This is especially easy to spot because, you know, taking pictures is like pointing your phone cam up at the, the, um, the little spy cams. Again, if you see something, say something. The best role of CERT is to stay safe, say something, let someone else that's got professional expertise in this uh, handle it. Contact your local law enforcement or use the FBI suspicious activity reporting tip line uh, at oh. Judy, yeah. just I know I shouldn't say anecdotes. I was busted for taking pictures of spy cameras twice. See? So uh, something says yeah. get down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. That's good. That's wor it's working. Uh, okay. Seaburn. Seaburn is chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or explosive. And how do you find how do you tell that this something like this is going on? Again, this is somebody being terrorist. They're trying to cause some kind of a, an activity. So what do you look for? Any kind of a vapor cloud or mist that is unusual for the area or for the time of day. Uh, is something that's out of place, unattended packages, boxes, vehicles. Uh, multiple victims exhibiting similar symptoms. For instance, all of a sudden, everybody in an area starts coughing. That's a very multiple victims exhibiting similar symptoms. You know something's going on in the air in that area if all of a sudden everybody starts coughing. If you observe any indicators, do not touch it. Move away from the problem and then report it. This is really important. I want to stop on this one because do not touch it. We're not trained to do this kind of, of work. We're not, we're not going to do anything about terrorism except report it. Move away from it because if it's a dangerous thing, your cell phone may actually set it off. You want to move away from the area where the danger is. You want to move away from the danger yourself. Uh, and you want to report it so that somebody else can, uh, can take appropriate action for it. So if you find a suspicious package, don't touch it, move away and report it to the authorities. And here's the caution that I just mentioned using cellular phones or two-way radios may detonate an explosive device. I don't, I don't know how often this happens, but I do know that it does happen because I believe that the uh, um, cell phones or two-way radios were used in the Boston bombing, for example. So I'm gonna change the subject a little bit now and talk about uh, you know, when we were thinking about Seaburn, the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive, those kind of things, uh, I'm going to talk about shelter in place because if you've got a bad air situation, so why might we do this? We might shelter in place because usually it's because there's something we want to get away from, some kind of situation that is disturbing the air and that could potentially be health or life threatening. Again, greatest good for the greatest number, go inside. So what does shelter in place procedures look like? You want to shut off your ventilation system. 
because your furnace or your air conditioner is probably bringing in air from the outside and then conditioning and sending it in for you. So shut off your ventilation system. Go to your shelter in place room, which is hopefully somewhere in your house with minimal doors and windows so that you have less stuff to tape up. Use some pre-cut plastic sheeting to cover your air openings, like the picture shows little taped up windows and taped up doors. Those are places where the air can get in. Tape sheeting over doors, windows, and vents. Again, we're trying to cut the air uh, you know, off from the outside air. Use duct tape to seal other areas if needed. Duct tape is a little harsher than blue tape, so I'm going to suggest blue tape for everything. Uh, listen to a battery-powered radio. Uh, you may not have uh, access to your cell phone if something like this is happening. So make sure you have a battery-powered radio in your, in your go kit or in your stay-at-home kit. Battery-powered radio will give you access to, uh, to AM radios, which still exists, thankfully, and, uh, and news about what's actually going on. And then once the all-clear is given, and you'll hear that on your radio, once the all-clear is given, ventilate the room once contaminants are gone to make sure that your, your air is nice and clean again. Um, and okay, so here's the big thing on CERT. You're the help until the help arrives. CERT volunteers are not equipped or trained to respond to terrorist incidents. You basically want to stay safe. If you find yourself in a situation that you believe to be a terrorist attack, focus on the most life-saving interventions. Move those that are in grave danger to a safe place if you can. Open their airway if, they, if they're having problem breathing. Stop the bleeding, which is, these are all things that you're learning how to do. If you can, then go ahead and do these things. Prevent shock if you can. Uh, if you cannot, then move to a safe place. Consider the impacts of stress and fear on yourself and others. It may take you a couple of minutes to realize that, OMG, I don't know what to do. That's okay, take a deep breath, go to a safe place. Always go to a safe place. Be alert to the possibility of a second coordinated attack. And then uh, Don, I think you're going off next. So let me stop sharing. Depends on the situation. So I have done this. So I was on an airplane flight. Uh, many of you have seen this. I was sitting down, somebody came on to the plane, dropped their backpack and left the plane. Well, that's not cool. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, it's probably nothing, blah, blah, blah. I told the stewardess, that's the authority. OK, and she uh, she knew about the person. They had left the plane uh, and they told them they were leaving and they were coming back. I might say the same thing happened to me once when I left the plane. I got reported and I came back and there's also to people crowding around my seat. So it depends where it is. It could be a police officer. It could be a security officer. Uh, it's somebody who's in authority in the situation. So, uh, you know, this is a that's a tough one. And and. Uh, we have a minute. So one of the issues that we worry about when we say, if you see something, say something, uh, is, a, is the issue of profiling. And I don't want to get into that, but uh, you know, if, if there's somebody there that fits your own personal view of somebody you should worry about, that's not necessarily what you want to report. You have to use your own best judgment and try and take any bias that you might personally have. We all have them out of the action that you, you do but it's much better to err on the, on the safe side. I have seen, I'm not supposed to tell anecdotes, so I won't tell about the funny, the silly things I have reported <laughs> in the past. Uh, people flowing, throwing flowers on the street, up and down the street early in Washington, DC during a Marathax, and I thought it was white powder. Ah, uh, wrong. But anyway, I did tell someone. All right, back to personal decontamination procedures. So you want to leave the area, but don't go very far, right? You don't want to, you want to get out of the immediate danger area, but you don't want to spread the contamination anywhere else. And you want to stay in the close enough so first responders can take care of you. So, so get out of, you know, get out of where there's whatever it is, the cloud or whatever it is, but don't get in your car, don't drive to a hospital, wait for somebody to, to tell you, uh, somebody, that's got a hazmat insignia, whatever it is, to tell you what to do, because we really aren't trained to understand what's going on. Uh, remove everything. Uh, typically, that means everything. Wash your hands before using them to shower. Uh, shower or flush with cool water. I have seen in exercises where the hazmat team will come in and set up 
basically tents or barriers and then flush off with cold water and blot dry. But, but the last one is important. Don't assume you've taken care of everything. Report and wait for the professional decontamination. Okay, so that, that's, you know, don't assume you know how to deal with this stuff because you certainly don't. It's very technical. See, what will professional uh, do when they show up? Uh, they're going to do the same kinds of things that we've been trained to do. They're going to they're gonna, uh, size up what's going on. They're going to see how the situation is, how much worse it could get. Uh, one of the things to worry about with a, with a terrorist attack, not so much with a criminal, is it really setting up for a secondary attack? And I'm sure uh, when Bruce trains his folks to do this, I'm sure he tells them all about how to do this. <clears throat> what measures can be taken to control the incident safely and what resources will be needed. So the professionals are going to think about what to do next. And they're there to, they're there to help you. They're there to contain the situation and take care of you if possible. And the best thing to do is listen to them and don't get in their way. All right, let's talk about an active shooter. Bruce, uh, this is obviously of a lot of concern to a lot of people, whether it's terrorist or criminal or anything else. And I think uh, I'm certainly not experienced enough to teach this, so you're on. Okay, could everyone hear me? Could you hear me, Don? I can hear you. Okay, hello everyone, good evening. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Bruce Dower, I'm with the Warner Creek Police Department. Uh, I currently manage our active shooter team. Um, I have either supervised it or managed it uh, for the last 10 years, and I train our department on how to respond how to respond to active shooter critical incidences. So when we talk about active shooter, some of the things that you hear in the news are, you know, nothing like, we're not talking about terrorism, like Don talked about, but we're talking about things that can happen in everyday life. You know, active shooter incidents could happen at com community events, uh, such as a fair, you know, anything uh, that your city could be throwing you know, in your community. It's uh, lots of times it's uh, connected to workplace violence. Um, you've heard many stories of active shooters throughout the country at schools and it's just not colleges, but it's colleges, high schools, middle schools. Um, all schools uh, have been victims of active shooters, incidences, and shopping violence. So uh, these are some examples of where active shooter incidents could occur. So what I want to provide uh, to you today is uh, the, the simple concept of run, hide, and fight. Um, as you're reading the screen that describes each actions that you would be taking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Don uh, play a six-minute video, um, which would which would um, describe run, hide, and fight in its entirety. And then I'll uh, after the video, I'll say a few more things on how um, we respond and what our mindset is. So Don, if you could go to um, that video. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. Sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, 
but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight, act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm him, and commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. So if you think those three words, run, hide, and fight, hopefully that helps you with any type of indecision, um, uh, things that might be going on in your mind. So indecision is, is uh, definitely an enemy. So just remember those three things and act upon those three things. Uh, also in the video, uh, connected to indecision, um, you see people that are overly panicking. You're gonna have the ones that are gonna be kind of pulling you back. They're gonna have paralysis of the muscles or you're not be able to react and stuff like that. Uh, when you see something like that and you're in the inside the room and you see people just, just going crazy, give them a task. That's the easiest thing to do is give them a task. Um, just to get their mind off of yes. um, the panic. Um, and that might calm it down or you know, help them breathe. So those are some things that uh, you can help people uh, to get through some type of, you know, hesitation, decision, and panic mode. Uh, giving them a task helps a lot. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention about the video itself, and then I'm going to go into using this as a segue of kind of describing how um, Water Creek Police Department and most of the nation response to after shooter incidences. The, the video that you saw showed law enforcement, you had four officers 
uh, with the AR rifle, uh, two with ARs and two with handguns, and walking down the hallway, trying to clear clear the the space. Um, that this video is just a little bit old because um, our approach and mindset has changed dramatically. So the way we trained in the way we train in Walnut Creek in most of the Bay Area, most of California, in fact, is uh, we don't wait. Um, our, our officers make the immediate decision. When they come on scene, they go straight to the shooting. Uh, we don't wait for cover. In the video, you have four officers, so it indicates that officers are waiting for a team to come up, they assemble a team, and they go in and they, they try to find a shooter. Today, if you are the first officer on scene and your nearest cover is three minutes away, um, you are going to be that only officer that's going to be going in, going towards the shooting, trying to engage the shooter by yourself until cover comes. Um, that's what we signed up for. That's how, how we can't train. Walnut Creek PD provides all the tools to do so as safe as we can. Uh, but so you know, um, when an officer arrives, uh, they hear shooting, they're going to go straight to the noise of the shooting. Um, that brings up to my next point. Um, kind of supporting what the video talked about, of, you know, we're not going to be uh, looking at injured people. We'll be bypassing injured people. Um, our, our immediate um, goal and mission is to stop the shooting. In order to do that is in an active shooter situation, when you hear active shooting going on, we have to run straight to that noise. Now, in the event that shooting stops, that's when officers slow down and then they'll start doing more methodical searches until they hear that shooting again. During those pauses is when um, the primary officer on scene could have a chance in coordinating his location, coordinating response as far as resources and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, just, you know, if you're, if you run, hide or fight, if you're hiding, um, you know, you know, we're going to be passing the doors. We're going to be not looking for you. So don't think, you know, where are the cops? If you hear shooting, the first thing in your head, you should be thinking is that they're going towards that shooting because your first goal is to stop the shooting. Um, and then once all the shooting stop, that's when we'll start doing a methodical search. Um, if you are hiding, stay where you're at. Um, keep the doors locked um, and methodically as time moves on, um, no shooting is better than hearing shooting. So if there's no shooting and there's a long period of time, hopefully that means officers are searching the area and eventually they'll be, they'll be coming towards your location and hopefully finding you. Um, so that's kind of how we respond um, and kind of when when we do that methodical search, one of the most common questions that come up is, well, how do I know to open the door? How do I know it's not the bad guy? How do I know it's, you know, the bad guys have to try to trick us to open the door and then we open the door and they shoot us. So one of the things that we do, we tell citizens is, um, you know, sometimes you can ask for a business card. A bad guy is not going to have a business card that has a uh, police officer's information on it. But not all police officers carry business cards on them. So you could ask for, hey, you have a Velcro patch on your vest. Could you rip that off and throw it underneath the door? That could be another uh, way of verifying ID to open that door. Uh, another form technology-wise is, hey, who has a who has a uh, um, an iPhone in this room? Well, Walnut Creek PD issues every single officer an iPhone. We can do a quick FaceTime and say, hey, give me someone's number. We'll FaceTime you and you'll see that we are right in front of your door. Please open it. And that's another way of verifying it. So those are some, some tools to help verify if you are stuck in uh, a room and someone knocks on the door and they say that, hey, I'm law enforcement. Those are a few ways of verifying that for law enforcement. Uh, so lastly, what I want to touch upon is um, I, I said that Walnut Creek Police Department uh, equips our officers to try to do the job. Um, the safest way, obviously, going into an active shooter and you're going to be by yourself. Um, it's not safe. It's very dangerous. Uh, but what we want to do and we, what we want to make sure we prevent is the incident. And I always forget, I think it's Uvalde, where the officers um, waited and people got killed. 
Well, that's not going to happen in Walnut Creek because we want to make sure that every officer is equipped with the proper equipment so they have that confidence of as soon as they roll up into that parking lot, they grab all the issued equipment that we provide them and, um, and, uh, and they go in. So what is that equipment? Our officers are equipped with AR rifles with suppressors. We have mini shields that every single car has. They're, they're rated for rifle ballistics. We uh, have ballistic helmets. Um, we have uh, new uh, handguns with red dots. That means that we can fire our target much quicker. Um, and then also we have uh, other things like drones. We have, you know, that did come later on. But as far as an officer going in by himself, they're going to be all armored up. They're going to have enough firepower and um, they're going to be able to find, locate, contact, and hopefully stop the threat um, on their own if they have to until help arrives. So, in a nutshell, that's um, how we respond to an active shooter incident. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer any. So, <clears throat> Judy, maybe you can put the slide up. Bruce, thank you so much. Uh, what I, everybody needs to know is that Bruce has been working with CERT since he was a newly minted sergeant. He's now Lieutenant Jowler. He has called us out on multiple occasions to do various events. So we're very happy to be working with him. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, he mentioned that he runs the active shooter training and exercises, but the CERTs were called out to be victims. I've done that That's three right. separate times. There is no better way to learn what Bruce is teaching you than to be on the ground pretending you're injured while you watch all these things happen. It's very educational. It can be disturbing, but it's it's great training. I know Bruce looks at us as helping them do training, but it's also training us at the same time. So it's a great program in Walnut Creek. And uh, and we are very fortunate that Bruce is. Bruce cares about CERT, so it's 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 great all around. Yes, and talking about uh, uh, um, trainings, we're going to do one this year, and hopefully we're going to need more role players. So uh, keep your ears out. I'll be putting out a, uh, a list of uh, uh, for role players. Later it's on. wonderful. They, they, they put you moulage. They, they, they put you makeup on. It's a, it's a ball. It's a yeah. lot of fun. All right, let's keep going. We're uh, closing in on the end here. So how do you prepare for terrorism? Well, you know what? It should sound familiar to you. This is the last class of the CERT Academy. So you know all this already. You should have a supply, a disaster supply kit. You should have a safe room. Judy talked about decon, about um, shelter in place. You should have a family communication plan. And the bottom, of course, is stay informed. Only use authoritative and official sources of information. Now, there's always a question is, what is that? But you'll know it when you see it for the most part. It's something that comes from the police department. It may come from an AM radio. Uh, social media can be a little bit a little bit iffy, depending on what it is. Uh, next door may or may not have accurate information on it. So as I said, don't participate in social amplification. Don't spread false rumors. Wait till you have really good information. If you do that as a CERT member, you're helping rather than harming if you pass on good information. So that's really important. So what else might we do? So Bruce talked a little bit about this too. Fear is contagious, but so is confidence in staying calm. Uh, I have this picture of the air raid, uh, air raid wardens uh, from the, the Blitz in, in London in World War II. The reason I show that is uh, I think if any of you are old enough to watch the old movies, you saw these folks running around. And one of the most important things they did, and Bruce mentioned this, I was so happy to hear it, by giving these folks things to do, that is to walk around and tell people to turn out their lights and things like that, even more important than what they actually did was it gave them something to do and it helps them stay calm. And I've seen studies that show that the benefit was more in terms of staying calm and giving people actionable uh, things to do than it was actually walking around and 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 doing the the uh, turning out lights. So Bruce told you about that. Give people something to do if they feel that they are, or Bruce will give us something to do if we feel we're helping, and we, you really want Bruce to or somebody in authority to do it. If you feel you're helping, it helps you stay calm. All right. 
So I talked about social amplification. That's how the terrorists win is if we blow things out of all proportion. So how do we how do we defeat that? Trust in the authorities, pass only accurate, consistent information, even if the answers were not sure, but stay tuned. It's very important. Don't make up an answer. If you don't know it, say it. And the people who have successfully managed uh, major national incidents, I've heard talks from them, they are quite frank when they say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you or I'll let you know when I do know, as opposed to making up what's going on. And uh, my own feeling is that search can be a venue uh, for spreading good information and keeping people calm. As I said, I was in Washington during 9-11 and uh, there was all sorts of panic going on. I wish I knew about CERT at the time because I could have used them to help, to help calm down the community at large. So with that, I think we are done on time, Margaret. Thank you, that's wonderful.